morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming on a Saturday morning um, to this event. Um, I believe you're all now well acquainted with Sam Hughes, who's the deputy leader of the uh, Liberal Democrat Party. Um, he's just going to talk for you about uh, about ten minutes about what he's been up to and uh, what you've been working on, and then of course uh, I'm sure Sam can mind taking some questions uh, from you all. So um, yeah, Simon. Kenny, okay, thank you very much. It's a terrible photograph. You can lose the photograph. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming Saturday morning. Other competing bids available, clearly lying in bed. Um, what I thought I'd like to do is just give you sort of literally about 10 minutes of how I came to end up doing politics as opposed to doing all the other things we could do like, because uh, it's a bit relevant to what you're doing because it started when I was a student. Um, and then share with you a bit where I think the politics of this country is now. And then absolutely be open to anything that you want to ask, and um, obviously I'm here uh, because Kenny uh, invited me and Kenny is standing uh, to be elected to the, to the council. And one of the things that I think is really important, one of the best people I ever had working with me was somebody who became the youngest councillor we'd ever had in Southwark um, and was able to take young people's issues into the heart of the decision making process, but also then get the decision making of the local authority to relate back to people at college and people at university. And one of the things Kenny and I, for example, have been doing just very practically this morning is talking to shopkeepers in Falmouth about how university purchasing policy could try to make sure it places its contracts with local businesses based in Cornwall. So it supports local businesses, doesn't just do online ordering to companies that supply stuff from London or somewhere else to try to help the local economy. And those are very practical things that would produce jobs here and so on. So, so that's what we're doing, and I'm very happy to support Kenny doing that. Um, I became interested in politics when I was a teenager. Um, I lived in an area where, I lived in South Wales, um, in the Pontypridd constituency, which was a solid Labour seat. Labour were in power at the time. Um, I fairly soon decided I wasn't a Tory because I thought that they, in the end, uh, left society less fair than when they started, that they didn't believe in the sort of justice, economic justice that I believed in. But Labour in power, and Labour were both really autocratic locally, so they were very um, patronising and didn't really engage people. It was a top-down local government. And Harold Wilson, who was the Prime Minister, ran the national government on the basis of basically doing deals with the union. So if there was a problem, it was get the unions around for beer and sandwiches and sort something out. I didn't sense it was great from a great principle about how we did government. So I wasn't sure uh, that I could support them, so I wrote away to the local Liberal Party office in Cardiff and <coughs> said, uh, please send me your manifesto, and I received it, and I read it, I thought, this is extraordinary, I agree with most of this stuff, so I must be one of them, whatever one of them was, which was a Liberal. And then I became more involved, and the two things internationally that can, drove me into politics in a way were one an issue which has now, thank God, been resolved, which was apartheid in South Africa. Uh, here was a country run by a minority, no votes for the majority, clearly obscene in terms of uh, any system. And this was a country we had run, Britain had run, and the legacy we left was unfair. And I did lots of work after that in the anti-apartheid movement. And the second, unfinished business, is that in the Middle East, Israel had been given a state, but Palestine hadn't got a state. And I still continue to do a lot of work to try to make sure that we end that injustice and have done a lot of work with um, uh, people in the Middle East and spent quite a lot of time working on uh, supporting Palestine to get into a position where it can be recognised and trying to get the government in the UK to put pressure on Obama and people to get the result right. You probably gather Obama's been in Palestine and uh, Israel this week. Then went to university became involved in the Student Union, became president of the Student Union at university. Um, and uh, from there, in the end, got involved in local politics where I lived in Southwark. I, I studied abroad in Bruges at the College of Europe, went to work in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg and in the Commission in Brussels, came back, trained as a lawyer, got involved in local community things. Um, and then was asked if I'd stand for the authority in London, the Greater London Authority, and stood um, in 81, it sounds a million years ago before any of you were even not just born, but even thought of, or probably your parents even knew what to do, so it's so long ago. Um, and um, 
uh, stood for election, uh, put our vote up in an area where Liberals have been pretty thin on the ground. We've had no council seats. We had, um, I think, 7% of the vote at the general election. Um, and gradually built that up. And the result of that was I was actually selected for Parliament. Uh, and uh, you probably know somebody who looked at it, won a by-election 30 years ago this year, biggest swing ever in British political history, not the most comfortable by-election, we can talk about it if you like, in terms of the politics of that. Um, but I hope vindicated by the fact that I've been re-elected seven times in the same seat, so I can't be doing everything wrong um, in what is naturally Labour territory. It's, it's territory where we have more people as a percentage of the voters in council property than any other MP in England. So it's, it's the, that's far different from Falmouth. Um, uh, Truro is sort of anywhere else. Um, move on a bit to where we are, I think, in British politics. When I was first elected, no, go back, um, at the, halfway through the last century, between 90 and 100% of all votes cast in the UK were cast for the Labour Party or the Tory Party. And the quick sweep of the history of the last century is that 100 years ago, the Conservative Party, large and dominant, the alternative was the Liberal Party. 100 years ago now, there was a Liberal government, very radical progressive government, introduced the state pension, introduced national insurance, uh, had the people's budget, which was a big you know, redistribution of wealth, tried to reform the House of Lords, unfinished business. Um, Hundred years, but a good progressive government. Asquith led. Lloyd George was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Went into the First World War. Lloyd George became Prime Minister, uh, and continued to the twenties. Liberals made mistakes. Uh, we bluntly didn't engage adequately with the rise of the trade unions uh, and workers' rights. We didn't, in my view, uh, engage adequately with the women's movement and the suffragette movement, and we've probably got some decisions wrong about Ireland. So. Um, in the period from 1918, the end of the First World War, till 1950, bluntly Labour became the second party and we slipped down almost to disappearance. And we ended up with 2% of the vote, five seats, six seats in Parliament. But we didn't disappear thanks to great visionaries like Joe Grimmond. Um, and the party gradually grew. In the 70s, it realised that the way to engage with people was often, if you were a small party, not to rely on Parliament, but to get out into the communities and build up grassroots support, and did that increasingly successfully, and the last um, 30 years have been hugely successful, in the sense that, at elections in the UK now, uh, only about two-thirds of people vote Labour or Tory, uh, roughly 20 to 25 percent consistently at elections have supported us. The nationalists in Wales and Scotland have grown, the Green Party has arrived, in Northern Ireland, other parties have grown. So we have much more pluralist politics, and people realise they have more choices. And the UKIP is about another party appearing as a non establishment party because two parties are now in government, therefore, different by definition, sort of the establishment, not some of the Tories, and uh, Labour are not perceived as being a progressive alternative to people who would vote Green or UKIP or something else. So we're in a much more interesting politics. People are not as tied to family voting. Uh, a generation ago, most people voted the way their parents did. And most people voted according to their community. So if you came from South Wales, then your parent and your dad was likely to have been in the mines. All the miners would have voted Labour because that's where the workers voted and therefore the wives would have voted Labour and the children would have voted Labour. Um, in my area, in the docks, it was the same. Um, uh, that's no longer the case. All those big industries have gone, uh, people move around much more. So much more of a lot of politics. So that's a good thing. People have to think for themselves, no assumption. Secondly, um, the decision about the last election, which was controversial, I would hope I could persuade you in the end was the rational one for us to make. Labour lost the election, weren't popular, Gordon Brown not popular. Um, we plus Labour didn't make a majority. We plus Labour, even with all the other parties, sort of barely made a majority. And the coalition, depending on all the Irish parties and the nationalists and so on, would have been a very shaky coalition. And I think the moment of the last election, I don't know whether you remember, but Greece was going through the sort of economic turmoil that Cyprus is going through at the moment. 
it looked as if Europe was really on the, on the brink financially. And therefore we needed a government fairly quickly, if not very quickly, that would get to grips with our economic position. That was all the press <coughs> was saying, we need a government now. The only coalition that was possible to give a majority was Conservatives plus us. We made a promise that we'd talk first the party that was the biggest party, Tories were the biggest party, and then we did negotiation for three or four days. And we got two thirds of our manifesto into government policy, and we thought that was a reasonable deal, including the biggest thing for us, which was taking the tax threshold up from 6,000 to 10,000 so that lower paid people would not have to pay any tax. That for us was the big, big change, and getting wealthier people to pay more. The thing we didn't win, of course, was the battle over tuition fees, which we can talk about, um, and, uh, and there's some other things. Formed the government, we were right. The only alternative would have been that we would have let the Tories run the government on their own as a minority party. And those of you who know your political history know that what's happened when that's happened in the past, it happened in the 70s, fairly rarely in the UK. Wilson formed a minority government. What happens after a few months, they then go back to the monarch and say, we want an election, please, because we need a majority. And normally, the British public give that party a majority, because they say, look, you, know, you may not have got a majority last time, but we understand you need a working majority to get your stuff through, we'll give you a go. And there would have been, I'm pretty well certain, in the same year, a general and second election, Tories would have got a majority, and we would now have an entirely Tory government. Our view was it was better that we were there tempering the policies, adjusting the policies, negotiating the policies to make for a fairer Britain. And for the government to understand better the needs of poor people struggling than it would have done under Tories. So that was the justification. We knew it would take five years. I'm not a natural Tory supporter. My seat has almost no Tories in it. So it wasn't a decision to go in with our mates. The Tories aren't our mates. But it was a practical decision to work for five years in the public interest to sort out the economics of Britain. We knew by the end of five years we might not have been able to do it all. It clearly is really difficult because growth in the European Union and beyond is slow. But we've pulled lots of levers. There are over a million new jobs in the private sector since the general election, which is phenomenal. Many more than have been lost in the public sector. Unemployment is now coming down slowly through the youth unemployment. We have a record number of people in some sort of work that we've ever had in the UK. Um, and we have a record number of company formations. So although growth is still teetering on the plus side of the line, nonetheless, a lot of things are slowly moving in the right direction. Uh, the deficit has been cut by a third, we still have big debts, and we're still paying 120 million quid a day in the interest on our debts, which is not sustainable financially, which is what I'm trying to get rid of. Um, I think the big challenge for you good people, and for the country in 2015, don't think it's the first time ever we've had fixed terms for Parliament, before they were uncertain, so we know when the election will be, will be uh, whether people think that the Tories or Labour or us, because we're now at least all regarded as premiership teams, are capable of delivering competent economic management and a fair society. I think, fundamentally, that the Tories normally can be economically competent, though I don't think that's self-evident, but I never will trust them to deliver the fair society as much as I would like it. I don't think the record of Labour uh, shows that they were very clever on all the economic things, and I think they left the country with people with more personal debt than we've ever had from a personal debt, family debt, as opposed to national debt than before. Um, and the real tragedy for me is that under all the Blair years, we ended up with a less fair society than when we started. My constituency, some of you will know, is in uh, London. Every bridge from the city of London comes into my seat. I look out over Canary Wharf. During Labour's years, the people in the banks in Canary Wharf were paid bigger bonuses than ever before. I mean, obscene bonuses, more money than anybody could ever and reasonably need for anything. And that was Labour policy that did that. The top rate of tax under Labour was never more than 40% until the last few weeks, when it went up to 
So even when next month it comes down to 45%, it'll be higher, more money will be collected from the rich in every year of this parliament than any year under Labour. So I think they're disappointed terribly. They did some very good things. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that says Labour or bad, Tories or bad. I recognise, for example, good investment in health service and schools. Uh, but our, our challenge will be to say, um, if you British people want a fairer Britain as well as a well-run Britain, we think we can offer as good a way of doing that as any. Last three things, just a list really. We're an internationalist party. We don't believe the solution to the world's problems and Britain's problems is to pretend that we can go it alone, pull up the drawbridges, uh, retreat from the EU, um, and take on the world from our little 60 million enclave, when we've got Russia and China and Brazil and so on. Two, we're an environmental party. We've got to stop the planet being completely shafted for the next generation. And three, we're a devolution of power party that says government doesn't know everything best. You should have strong governments at a UN level and a European Union level, but within a country like ours, the more you can devolve to Scotland and Wales and England and Cornwall and local government and parish councils and things, the better, because actually people know their own parish better than fiscal's a long way away. I hope that's a helpful start, just to quickly count around the houses. Um, and I'm really up for anything that you'd like to ask about. Anything at the end, I, mean, I have no idea what politics you all have, no idea what um, uh, issues matter. I'm always very keen that if you are interested in some extent in politics or um, the political process, to say if you want to follow stuff up either by uh, email, then we'll do that through Kenny and uh, I can liaise with you. If ever you want to follow it up by coming up to Westminster and actually having a session with ministers and parliament looking at it more closely, I'm very happy again with Kenny's help and the help of our colleagues in Cornwall to sort that. And if any of you ever think that you might want to come and do an internship or work experience or stuff, I'm always up for that, as are my colleagues, because it's important we share the opportunity of engagement in the political process with the next generation, so you understand the score. So, who's going to go first? The man in the multicoloured socks, I think, <coughs> might be a good candidate. Um, Fantastic socks, very good. Um, thank you. Um, as you mentioned um, the by-election, yeah. given that 30 years later we've had the one in Eastleigh, how do you think um, electioneering has changed in over the period of time? That That's a good question. Experienced it? It's a very good question. Um, in the last, uh, well, by-elections are much less frequent now, is the first thing. Uh, people used to stay in Parliament uh, longer and there were many more older MPs who therefore died and became ill and resigned, so by-elections more frequent. Also parties let, they appointed people to be ambassadors or they appointed people for other jobs which meant they had to create a vacancy. Parties now generally don't like by-elections and don't create them where they can avoid it. Uh, because you're often on the hiding to nothing in a by-election. So there are fewer of them, that's the first thing. Secondly, um, in terms of campaigning, uh, they haven't changed fundamentally, interestingly. Uh, television played quite a big part in by-elections 30 years ago. The media is, of course, much more diffuse now. So, uh, 30 years ago, there was no social media at all. Uh, the key judgments on the by-elections were provided by the BBC One channel, and there was a guy called Vincent Hanna who was alive, who did all the by-election programmes, and he could basically make or destroy candidates. Uh, by his filming and so on. Um, and certainly the by-election after mine, which we might have won, we lost because our candidate was shown to be not up to it by TV, lovely. So uh, the media is highly relevant, but it's much more diffuse, and by-election candidates need to be even more careful of not being tripped up by the media now than before. Um, thirdly, 30 years ago, Prime Ministers never used to take part in by-elections. It was always regarded as too risky. Generally, now a Prime Minister will get stuck in, uh, especially if they think they can win. 
Um, and fourthly, they some, and this hasn't changed, they sometimes change the whole politics of the country and they sometimes don't. Um, I think Eastleigh has. I think the fact that we could hold Eastleigh, you sort of expect me to say this, but I think even the Tory, if you had a Tory MP here, I think they would admit, if, if we held Eastleigh, um, caused by the resignation of a, an MP who is now in prison, um, held at the time of allegations about the former chief executive of our party, which have not been resolved, um, I in the least, and when we were on about 10% of the opinion polls. So hardly the most propitious time. We held it not by a couple of votes, we held it quite well. The main challenger got knocked into third place by another party. The national opposition got stuck in fourth place with no change in the vote. I think it has created greater turmoil than the Tory party. And I think they're now really struggling. Every week the papers are full of Will Cameron see through the election and other alternative leaders and so on. So I think it is a significant by-election. As mine was um, in really giving the Labour Party a hard time in 83. But some by-elections come and go and to be honest if it's in a safe seat in the middle of the winter nobody notices. Is that a fair comment? So I've selected something. So some changes but <coughs> campaigning not fundamentally different. I mean, more sophisticated um, data use, obviously. We now have systems whereby we have much more accurate records of people, much more telephone counselling, uh, much more intensive counselling following the American pattern. But fundamentally, the same job, reaching the maximum number of voters with leaflets and doorstep contact and telephone contact and getting the maximum turnout. And the next. Yes, please. <laughs> Like you prodded for South Wales Run East, but um, I actually John Clyde Cymru as a teenager, yeah. but saw the light later on. Um, town Council of Deputy Mayor, but in a very short time I should be pounding the pavements and on the doorstep in support of my colleague here, who's been standing for ca the county election. Yeah. We're both on the Town Council. So I've got just one piece of advice that I could use when I'm facing questions on the doorstep. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll be completely straightforward with you. What I do, and it seems to work, is firstly, whenever I knock on somebody's door, you never know, I'll tell you a funny story in a minute, you never know who you're going to discover, uh, whether they're um, sober or not, uh, whether they're awake or not, whether they're in a good mood or not, uh, or whatever. So if somebody does answer the door, I always say, excuse me, I, I'm Simon, can I bother you for a minute, just a minute, and I, and I mean that, because you know, <coughs> intrusions on people's doorsteps are not always very well. Um, and um, I then say, I try and have a very clear message, so I'm here supporting my uh, colleague Kenny, um, he's standing for the elections on May the 2nd, um, have you thought about how you're going to vote, do you normally vote, whatever, um, can I just introduce him, and he just wants to say three things to you. And then I would ask Kenny to say something that lasted 30 seconds. I want to sound collection because... Da, da, da. Now, if they're then interested, then you can start a conversation and you have more than a minute's conversation. But I think having three very simple things, literally three sentences, for me, the reason I want to stand is because... Now, there's an issue we've discovered in Cornwall that the Tory-led council at the moment has very high car park charges and they use their car parks as cash cows for the council. We just heard from the shopkeepers in Falmouth uh, that they're often empty. And if they drop the charges by a third, by two thirds, they probably get many more people in, help the shops, and actually make more money. So little things like that. Let me tell you the first story. We went canvassing uh, on, in my constituency, the Elephant Castle, some years ago, a group of us. And one of our colleagues disappeared. The whole rule is you don't normally go inside because if you go inside, uh, by definition, that means you're having a longer conversation, taking more time, but also the rest of the colleagues don't know where you are. So the general rule is even if people say, Come in, we'd like to actually say, Not today, thank you. Anyway, just go. about 20 minutes later, uh, um, the door opened. Uh, sorry, we, we all gathered where I am, and um, uh, 
candidate reappeared. We said, what happened? What happened? Well, he said, uh, most extraordinary thing happened. Uh, person opened the door with absolutely nothing on at all. And we said, are you sure? Absolutely nothing on at all. And said, would you like to come in? And I'd never had this opportunity in my life, so I thought I would take the opportunity of discussing <laughs> politics with a very beautiful person at lunchtime on a sunny day um, when they clearly weren't inhibited about sharing their attractions with me. It was a good idea, so I took the opportunity. And we said, well, that explains a lot. You were, however, 25 or 30 minutes, we noticed, uh, which was presumably not all spent spending the, spending the <laughs> final points of Liberal Democrat politics. <laughs> To which the answer came back, we thought rather cleverly, well, all I can say is you should be very pleased with me because I have ended up discovering one new member. Um, so I leave you to reflect on that. Um, and uh, we did indeed get to our membership, <laughs> indeed. And, uh, so canvassing can be fun, it can be unexpected, <laughs> it, and you should be prepared for anything. And it is extraordinary, actually. I, I just relate. I've knocked on thousands of doors, probably millions of doors, it's just extraordinary how many people when you're up on the day out just a bit be going into the shower or going out of the shower. And thank goodness they're uh, using the shower. I guess. <laughs> Sorry, that was not a serious answer, but it's a bit of interruption. Okay, next uh, question, comment, thought. Be honest, anything? Yeah? I'll do the lead back on. Over here. Yeah, sorry. sorry, yeah. I was just wondering, how important do you think it is that students voice their opinions in these local elections? Yeah, the, the instinct would be for lots of students to say, I'm not going to bother because I don't come from here, I'm only here for a short time, I don't honestly feel I should comment, this isn't my patch, it's not going to change my life. Um, you could do that, and that's a reasonable thing, however, most of you will be here for uh, three years, I guess. Lots of students actually end up staying where they go to university, or locally, I mean, that's one of the things that happens. And there are things that the council does that affect what the student likes. Them. Councils run bus services, relevant to students. Councils run car parks and charges. Councils license pubs and clubs. Councils are responsible for uh, road safety. Councils are responsible for housing and building affordable housing. Councils are responsible, they can if they want to, give uh, uh, help with student finance. I mean, there are lots of things that councils can do, and so I think it is worth seeing whether the people you elect are, are student-friendly and understand the student agenda. When I was at university, we had local elections, we got the candidates in to a meeting like this, in the um, student union, and I'm sure the meeting was decisive in making sure that one of the candidates who was a Tory did not get elected, because he was clearly seemed to be arrogant and patronising and really didn't like the idea of being there and clearly thought students weren't going to vote so he wasn't really bothered and he'd get in without student votes. And therefore I'm sure he got very few votes from people in the room. Whereas the Labour candidate I remember was a, um, an academic and a, a member of the university staff, clearly understood the issues, was very sympathetic. Um, and the Monster Radio Loon Looney Party candidate was quite fun as well. Um, <laughs> I probably got a few votes in the students as well. But no, the answer, the answer is it is worth doing. It is worth doing. Um, and again, there's a very good reason for somebody who's a student being on the council. And there's a really strong reason in a place like this for somebody to be the direct link between student. Now, I have no idea of the numbers, I haven't gone through with Kenny, but, but if, the, if no student voted, almost certainly Kenny wouldn't get elected because more students are more likely to vote for another student. If quite a lot of students vote for Kenny, then he's quite likely to be elected because the student vote in this area is quite a big vote. It's a percentage of a certain number of votes. So it is worth doing. And you can therefore affect the result and be decisive about the result. And it does give you a access into the system. And there are, for example, there are students who write to me and come to see me in my patch normally about finance or accommodation, to be honest, but sometimes about practical things. I mean, people come to see me regularly if they have a dispute with their university about uh, marking exams, or if sometimes people get, um, they're off sick and they're not allowed to go back, or they want to change a course or something. So sometimes it's helpful to have a political support for 
a dispute you might be having or a negotiation you might be having with the university authorities. So I would encourage you to do that. I mean, if if you seriously if you don't vote for people who you haven't a clue who they are, and this is a serious point, often people turn up at a ballot voting place and there's a list of names and most of them you will never have heard of. Just caution you against voting for somebody even if they're a party you might be naturally drawn to if you've never heard or seen the candidate because they might be really inappropriate candidates. And I've certainly had elections where people have said to me, why should we vote for your person? We have never seen them. And I think that's a good reason and a good argument. And in the end, your elected representatives are people as well as party names and party logos. Yeah, take a question. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you all something, just sort of not too arduous for Saturday morning, but just, just to express a view of a couple of things. Yes, please. Yes. Just, I'm absolutely thrilled to see Kenny standing here as the student population on Kate Hutchings, on yep. Henry and West Kent, different accounts from that, that in, died in the war on there on the good days and the bad days. But um, what I'm um, I'm saying to this, I'm taking this opportunity not to say something to you, but to say to the students, you know, that you're a significant body of people in Penryn, and Penryn is not found with Penryn and Penryn. Mm -hmm. Now, the sidings is on my, on my patch, and um, the community that, um, that is Penryn is including the people who live there, whether you're a student or whoever you are there for 100 years. My late husband used to say that his family came to Penryn 200 years ago from Delibo, so that's as Cornish as that was, but we have we uh, we need all this young energy, and um, and we are there for you. I know that some people feel a bit alienated and things like that, but so do we, you know. And uh, we're there we're there for that. And it's what I say to people is come out and vote, you know get your name down there and vote because somebody is going to get in, and uh, you know that is really just yeah. I couldn't let the opportunity go without giving a bit of encouragement to the part to the party you're connected as a part of the people you're connected But that, I mean, that's, in a way, get the most important point of all. I mean, in elections, people complained last year about the police elections, that the turnout was low. Well, yeah. in the end, somebody gets elected. So, so, so not voting doesn't solve anything, and you are then without any influence. At least if you vote, you, you have a chance of influencing the outcome, which is hugely important. Can I just test? Let me just test something, and I'll come back. And I'll be as honest with me as you can, yeah, now. If there was, what are we now? We're now. If there was an election, general election, in May of this year, on the same day as the Cornish elections are, if you're willing to do so and you have a view which is that you are clear or fairly clear which way you'd vote yeah, in May of this year, then can I just see you know, just what the mood of this room is? Is that okay? Don't have to, I'm not. I'm going to report anyhow, I'm going to write everything down. And obviously, the election isn't this year, it's a choice. So, who would vote Conservative this May? Okay, one, two of you. Who would vote Labour this May? One of you. Who would vote for us this May? <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Who would vote Green this May? Okay. Who would vote Mebian Kerner this May? <laughs> Assuming you had two votes. <laughs> and who would vote you get this way? Okay, that's helpful. For those of you, class, that remind me the two of you who vote conservative, yeah? What would we need to do, yeah? To, uh, what would we need to do to persuade you to vote for us? Go on. I wasn't, I was actually initially, I was being sort of flattered with the idea of um, because I don't necessarily object to everything that Liberal Democrats believe in. I'm not like a, a right wing patriot, like that. Yeah. I'm, quite a, I'm yeah. quite a sort of Cameron enthusiast. So, yeah. um, there's not like a massive gap yeah. between, between my beliefs and perhaps your beliefs. Yeah. Um, I think, essentially, I think I've I don't necessarily share your ideas on things like the mansion tax. I don't believe in. I believe that your your views sometimes on taxing the rich can be a bit populist. I think okay. about Labour sometimes. I, I guess whether or not that's the reality, I don't know. But okay. that's my perception of it. And also, I, I guess I, where I come from in South Wales, Swansea, yeah. 
and there's a, a massive, massive. There was a Liberal Democrat council until very recently, and, yeah. and it got um, Labour kind of got back in. And I find that um, I've, I've been brought up obviously in a very sort of Labour kind of Liberal Democrat area, and I just yeah. find that a lot of the time, obviously Labour, like you were saying, they're not very good economically, they're not very confident, um, and the Liberal Democrats I find are better at managing things on the local level, and certainly I think at a local level they perform far better. Um, but on a national level, I find that the Conservatives are far more um, economically competent. And actually, they're not as unfair. <laughs> Maybe it's not so bad, but generally, historically, they are pretty, they're pretty efficient. I mean, you've, you've obviously said that as well. Um, but, uh, so I don't think they're as unfair as they're made out to be. I think sometimes there is that ideological view that they are quite unfair. I don't think, I don't think okay. they necessarily are. Okay, I mean... I'm not trying to push you up there, just respond to it for some things like On the mansion tax, the reason... I think we've been a bit small sea conservative in this country about how we look at taxation. Uh, and we spend most of our efforts concentrating on income tax, i.e. Like tax on income, and tax on company income, corporation tax. We, we don't very often think about taxing wealth. And so evidently that's different from income. It can be inherited wealth, or it can be accumulated wealth. And I think that a sensible country should try and get the, should never forget that actually the value of the assets you own is as important to your personal wealth as the income you have. And if you end up owning land which is very valuable, or owning a house which is very valuable, then there is no reason why the state shouldn't ask for a contribution for from the increase in the value, which is largely not due to, due to you. The house values have gone up, not because Mr. and Mrs. Average have made their house more beautiful, although some have. They've largely gone up because the values of houses have gone up. They're on a, they're on a tide, which has pushed up, and land values too. And therefore they're the artificial, they're the accidental beneficiaries of increasing values. And that what we say is if you end up owning an asset worth two million quid or more as a home, then in the amount above two million, it's not the value up to two million, in as much as it's worth more than two million, you ought to pay a contribution. It's really easy tax to collect because you can't hide it. And that's a real issue because people squirrel away money and put stuff in foreign banks and so on. Where's your house? Is your house? Is your house? Um, and it's very easy to quantify a value because they can be done. Um, and you don't have to pay it then if you're asset rich and income poor. So if you're a pensioner in a really valuable house, you could pay it when you die out of your estate dues. So we try to be intelligent about that, but we try also to realize that one of the ways to collect the money the state needs, and the state needs roughly 40% of our national income to run our public services, is by going to look at assets as opposed to only income, and that's, that's the argument. On the issue about whether the Tories are competent or incompetent, um, uh, I think there are arguments that they are generally, they've generally been more competent because they believe in being efficient with finances, but sometimes they can be crazily incompetent. I think George Osborne last, met last year in the budget was clearly incompetent, and the budget that had the pasty tax and the uh, uh, dropping the top rate of tax in the very year when we were trying to get the message across that we were lifting the burden on the poor was incompetent. <coughs> I actually think the budget this year was much more competent and I think it's learned a lesson from last year. Uh, I think one of the issues is with, <coughs> with sort of the coalition is we've got a lot of good ideas but we don't really tend to communicate them very well. Because they get, they, they, like last year we were saying that the budget there were, a lot, there were some good things in it yeah. but a lot of the bad yeah. things tend to, to dominate yeah. the whole thing. And the really frustrating thing for us, I mean, our big policy, front page number one on our manifesto, was lift the rate, the, the amount before you pay tax to £10,000 from 6000 which helps 25 million people in the country, takes 3 million nearly out of tax altogether. I have to say, the Tories now think it's such a good idea that they claim as if it was their policy, they're so pleased with it. Um, I, think, I, think, I think the Tories aren't necessarily, don't think it's a bad idea. No, 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 the Tories, the Tories, the Tories have decided it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, yeah. No, they tried to... Maybe we should have thought that it's not that. 
Yes, it's not no. a bad thing at all. No, 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 the Tories are not. The point I then was then going to make is so the Tories are not stupid at the higher level and they clearly can see a good it's idea and have adopted it. If you look at the history of Britain, we are, however, a more unequal society now than we have ever been. And we've become more unequal under Tory governments and under Labour governments. And for me, if we're giving equality of opportunity, you have to redistribute wealth as well as opportunity. And it seems to me that we've been going the wrong way in both governments, as you can look at the case. Let me take our friend here. Oh, I... Yeah, of course. Let me take our friend here first and I'll come to you. Yeah. Um, I wonder what your views are on uh, cultural parties, because I think... On what? Cultural parties, like... Try and get everyone to vote for you. Yeah. I think, I mean, obviously we've been discussing this. I think Lib Dems typified perfect cultural party. I mean, I'll be honest because you're you're saying like economically, you know, we're going to be competent. At yeah. the same time, we're going to do social re redistribution. You know, it seems like we're trying to get the best of both worlds. I think I'm not, you know, it's sort of naive to think Labour are not stupid. They're not. They're not. I don't think they got the way to be economically incompetent. No, no, no. I think you know. I mean, he did get it wrong, but I think he sort of tried to move the way forward to economically competent like in the first couple of years and tried to minimise a spending. And what you said earlier, like for the first, one of the first things you said, you said um, we're an internationalist party, we're an um, environmental party, we're a devolution party. It seems like you're trying to be everything to. I think people realise this, and that's why the Lib Dems have got such a nationally you know, I know there's many reasons why that's why they don't tend to get as many votes as they possibly do. And I think another problem for the Lib Dems is converting votes into seats. I think easily, I don't think that's a very good example, because I think that the problem with the Lib Dems is they concentrate support they're in very specific <coughs> areas, and Eastley is one of those areas, which is why I think it was always going to be a Lib Dem seat, you know, the Lord's going to run that. I think, you know, how would you, how would you approach changes? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, let me try and deal with them straightforwardly. First, let me take your last point first, which is about sort of seats. I mean, the reality is that um, for about the last 30 years, we have consistently got between 18 and 25 percent of the share of the vote every election, every general election. Um, but as you well know, we have um, a, an electoral system that doesn't translate share the vote into seats because we have a first past process. We have currently 8 percent of the seats having got 23% of the vote. Uh, that's clearly not good for British politics, that what people vote for they don't get. Um, there are other big problems about British politics. We have far too few women, far too few people from the black minority community and so on. So mm -hmm. Parliament doesn't yet look like, and, and isn't, what people vote for. We distort it, and we distort it because it's in the interest of the historically bigger parties to have a system that makes it more likely you'll have an alternating swing between the two major parties traditional parties. Um, therefore, you're right, we have to be intelligent, and you, we have to win under the present system. It's like just protesting, so, oh, terribly okay. And, and given that our vote is much more evenly spread across the country, whereas Tory and Labour votes are concentrated, Labour votes in traditional urban areas, Tory votes elsewhere, um, then we do build locally and seek to, as it were, create our own territory. And that's the only way you can you can break through, and over the last 50 years, that's what we have been doing. And we have built up um, from the Celtic fringe, which is where we used to be, to having seats in Scotland and England, Wales, urban and rural, north and south. But we're realistic. It's no good, say, in London, thinking we can suddenly put all our efforts into 20 seats without disadvantaging the seven seats we hold. And at the next election, given that we will have been in government for five years and government or governments always get a kicking, then we're not going to be stupid. We're going to concentrate first on defending our current territory and then aiming at winning some more seats, ideally from the Tories, where we think that's going to be easier because it's going to be difficult to win other seats from Labour next time. We're not right. On the catch-all party complaint, uh, there's a reasonable complaint that when we were in opposition, we were the repository of people's <coughs> process votes. We were the non-establishment process vote party. And throughout history, people have looked to some, when they wanted to protest against the government, they've either gone to the main opposition party or to a process vote party. 
and where we're credible, they've often gone to us. We've won a whole series of by elections over the years as the protest vote party. Um, we can't do that anymore because once you're in government, by definition, you can't be a protest vote party, and you give up. I would sort of disagree with that. Because Hang on a second. And then, please come out. Don't just sort of come back. When I then listed the sort of things we stand for, None of those, however, are different from what we had said in our manifesto 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We are a, a consistently internationalist party, which the Tories certainly aren't in the same way. Labour we could discuss. We've been a consistently environmentalist party before the Greens were born. Again, in a way that I would argue Labour and the Tories aren't in any way to the same extent. They're both pro-nuclear parties, for example which I think is one of the things which is not very environmentalist sound. Um, we are a devolutionary party. That is clearly not what the Labour Party are, who like central control, because that's what the municipal socialist thinks is necessary to deliver the <coughs> redistribution of wealth. Um, the Tories are um, maverick about that. They say they believe in devolution, but they don't always deliver. But, I mean, in terms of... Um, trying to be more confident on the economy. Well, I think you could argue that the person who is most popular as a national member of the government and thought to be the most competent on the economy is probably Vince Cable at the moment. Uh, I think all the polls I've always seen say that people trust him more with the economy than either Ed Balls or George Osborne. Which, and did you see the Party? Yeah. He, he, he did start in the Labour Party. Start in the Party. Um, and I think we have changed from being a party that wasn't perceived as being economically competent to be one that is perceived as more economically competent. And if at the end of the day, at the end of this parliament, we are in a better place, it will be partly because we've delivered. And on the fairness point, I think nobody's argued that we're not a party that's always, over the years, tried to produce a fairer society. So we're not doing anything now. We have held to those principles, even though we're now in government and not in opposition. But. Um, I understand the complaint when we're in opposition that we could be a catch-all party. I don't think you can be when you're in government. Let him just come back once and I'll come to you again. Yeah, it's not necessarily just the complaint the Lib Dems, but about British politics in general. Like, yeah. It's very limited debate, obviously, you know, honestly, and it's yeah. very, like, economic, for example, like you said about Labour being socialism, but the very, you know, the arguments are very, very similar in, um, in between Conservative and Lib Dems, um, Labour, sorry, over the budget, for example. And, it's more about, you know, both agree that you've got to implement, um, you've got to implement investments as well as spending, because, you know, there's no disagreement about that. I think yeah. one problem why there's a lot of political apathy is because it's very difficult to differentiate between yeah. the three main parties yeah. in particular. And I think that's what I was trying to get at, is yeah, necessarily, you know, is how would the Lib Dems, if they want to be, like, like I take the point about um, protests, I think those been over the recent time and been seen as a protest movement or a protest party, how they would, you know, if they were serious about going into government on their own, how they would turn that into seats or, or yeah. how they would turn that vote into seats. So. Last couple of quick things. I agree about you about the fact that um, parties are more similar now than they were. Uh, and the Labour Party was much more clearly a socialist party when people like Michael Foot led it than now. Um, it's now a social democratic party in the sort of common language. The Tory party struggles with what it is. When Michael Howard was the leader, William Hague was the leader, tried to be a more right wing traditional Tory party. David Cameron came to power as Tory leader to try to be a one nation Tory. He's got 100 people on his back bench and seems no more want to be one nation Tories than fly. And of course, he needs their votes to get things through, so there's, there's an internal tension. Um, I would hope. Uh, that we continue to be both a liberal and a radical party, but obviously government sometimes you have to temper that a bit. Um, and, and the traditionally very different parties in this country have almost disappeared. There are almost no communist candidates, very few real socialists other than Dennis Skinner and people uh, left. So I agree, and that's a problem. However, however, um, I think at local level and uh, between candidates, you do often find some quite big differences, and therefore the choice of who gets in matters. I'll give you just a practical example. At local level, um, in London, uh, 
Ken Livingston won elections some years ago because he had a policy for free bus fares, whereas the Tories didn't have a policy for free bus fares. And those things matter, and there are differentiating policies that are reflective of a political view. And I think, therefore, choices on issues can matter. And the Eastleigh by-elections show that had the Tory candidate been elected, they would have elected in Eastleigh a right-wing, anti-European, anti-Cameron Tory, who would have been very clearly a different sort of kettle of fish from Mike, who got elected for us and so on. So, so I think you often find differences between candidates, even though the parties may seem more the same. Sir? Yeah, I don't know where to start. I was going to ask you about the benefits of Cameron. Okay. Um, How long have we got, John? About one minute. <laughs> one minute. I guess yeah, no, well, a member of my family lives in Trump here. Um, they pay rent for a place which is £500 a month for a flat, a two-bedroom flat. They have a son who has to visit university to go there, obviously during the term time. They're now having to pay £40 a month for council tax because of the changes the current government have brought in. Um, basically, they've got their, they're just on the phone to me this morning saying they're having to borrow money, drawn up the debt £3,000 on the market card to afford to live to pay for food over the last two years. There's some myth in this country that people on benefits um, are well off. Actually, the benefits don't actually give enough money to live on. Yeah. If you, she's paying £500 rent, she's only getting £420 council tax benefit. She's got £50 to £60 a month electricity bill, got £25 a month water rates. I've just worked it out, and basically every month she's short by 100 it's going to be now £150 a month. Yeah. Now, you say your party is. I used to vote for the Broadway many, many times, yeah. but I won't now because I think. The Liberal Party and Lib Dems, as they kind of are, become a right wing party. You didn't live under Thatcher. Thatcher was more right wing, was less right wing than Cameron. I'm sorry. Uh, we've now got one of the most right wing governments that we've ever had in the history of this country. But I think if the Liberal Dems that are going to be, you know, promote the policies of justice and fairness, then they need to take a stand on those kinds of issues. Right? Okay. Okay. Let me quickly go Nick as well. I'm not unhappy to deal with it at length, but um, starting point, when we came into government, I gave the figure to our friend here, we were faced with having to pay 120 million quid a day interest on debt, not of our making, but of the legacy left. Yeah. And now, so, yeah, I'm not blaming it. It's a combination of international financial crisis, bankers, and last government, in some combination. And we also have the previous Tory government, yeah. which people yeah. don't Yeah, hang on a second, hang on a second. I'm just trying to use the time. So, there's a really difficult job to try to get the economy back, and it would mean cutting back in public expenditure. We have gone in there arguing to protect the welfare state as much as humanly possible. The Tories would have ravaged it in ways far more draconian than that. I'll give you three examples. Uh, George Osborne stood up in the House of Commons in June 2010 and said, I'm going to introduce a scheme whereby uh, people get their benefits cut by 10% if they have been out of work for more than a year as an incentive to people to get a job, whether or not they could. I said immediately, I will not vote for that. When the bill appeared in Parliament as a result of uh, me communicating that view to Nick Clegg as Deputy Prime Minister and my colleagues, it had disappeared from the bill. We had said we won't go along with that, it's unacceptable, it's discrimination. The Tories wanted this year, in the welfare cuts, to take housing benefit away from anybody under, 20, under 25. We said that's unacceptable, it's discriminatory, it didn't happen. The Tories wanted to take benefits away for children beyond the second child because they said we can't afford it. We said that's completely unfair and discriminatory, it hasn't happened. So we've fought battles and we have won some of them. Now, in the end, in a coalition, You've got to come to some agreement. The welfare benefits changes uh, have seen not any cuts in benefit, but they've seen a reduction in the increase to 1%. Not, in my view, because people on benefits are rich, because they're not, they struggle, but because that was the negotiated compromise with some exceptions, where people are not having any reduction at all, people with certain categories of disability. The really tricky one is the one you mentioned, which is the changing in housing benefit rules that comes into force this coming April. The principle is this, when the state pays for your housing rent, at the moment, if you were getting housing benefit 
from April, and you had living in the private sector, they will only pay you for the number of rooms your assessors needed. But until now, they would pay for everything that you had if you were in the council household, housing association sector. And the government said, this can't be fair. Why are we paying a full rent for somebody who's got spare rooms if they're council tenants, but we would not pay the same in private? So that was, that was the argument. We have been negotiating with the government to get exemptions. Uh, they announced some at the beginning. So if you need a live-in carer, then that room is regarded as one you need. If you're a couple who can't sleep together because of illness, then you're allowed to have two rooms. They've just made another exemption for people who are service personnel who come home. They've made another exemption just the other day on my request for foster carers so that they don't have to pay. We're trying to get it right. But I understand that it will mean some people will have a drop in their housing benefit. The system is that if you think you have a good case, you can go to your council and they have a bigger pot than they're going to have to help you out. If it's still a problem, then the government are saying to people, well, you're going to have to do what anybody else would have to do in the same case, either earn a bit more if you can, or use a bit of your savings if you can, or take in a lodger if you can. I'm not, I find it, I'm, it's a very uncomfortable policy change. Yeah, I didn't, I, I found it very difficult to support, but in the end, the logic of treating people in the private and public sector the same seems to be a reasonable starting point. And if we're trying to sort out our, our economic position, we can't discuss. So that's where we're, I'm not unsympathetic, and I deal with lots of those cases. I'm going to tell you, we have to go to, get, go to do something in Truro. Can you, I'll get to say something in a second. Can I repeat my offer? If that would be of interest to anybody, I'm very happy either to engage, to answer any questions uh, by email, and suggest that Kenny, if it can be through you, then I know that it's you lot and not random people from out of Mongolia who suddenly decide to email me. Who, is that okay? Uh, so if you want to, in what you say, you give people whatever, but your best contact email addresses, you can follow up. I don't know whether there's an attendance list for people who are here, but if there was, that would be really helpful. Okay, um, thank you very much for coming on today and for just have a huge round of applause. <laughs> and um, yes, if anyone wants to come to me with their email addresses, if you want to any more further questions, um, which I'm sure you'd be happy to answer in the future, or if you want to talk about um, some work or something like that, then just come to me afterwards. And what email address, Kenny? You just shout out your email address. Uh, it's ke233 and then it's at exeter.ac.uk. So, uh, most of you will know my next three email address, but if any of you want me to write that down for you, I'll be happy to do that. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Enjoy the weekend. <laughs>